So like you're looking around. Now I want to explain something. You see something get new getting built, and y'all like, what's he doing now? Okay, chairs are moved. I, I, I was telling Pastor George yesterday. I said some people have been coming here a sh- shorter than the amount of time we've had the chairs moved for COVID. What are we saying? What's the chairs? Be done with COVID, right? Get back to normal, right? Be done with it. Even though some people sat there and probably walked in this morning and was like, oh my gosh, where am I going to sit? Right? You took my chair. I promise your chair's in there somewhere. Your butt prints on it somewhere. It's fine. It's time to make a new one. All right? Now, um, obviously, if you can't tell, this is the baptism. If you haven't taken up, walk up here and you say, the message this morning is about front and center. And the point of the message with it being front and center is God gave me something about the baptistry, and it was a mistake on my part because my mindset was when I did the stage and designed the stage was around the functionality of the stage, not about the experience of the baptism. Now, we talk that we're a spirit-filled church, that we encourage baptisms of, of, of the body and of the spirit, and yet I left the baptism sitting back in a corner. Now you say, what, what's the big deal about this? It was a huge deal because as I watched family members have to walk on a stage and look through to watch somebody be baptized, it was discouraging to me. And every time it became, I can't wait to finally move the baptism. And we talked about where we're moving it to, and was it going to go into the back wall back here? We're going to put it back there. And then it was like, it's the same thing. It's it's, 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 we're putting it back in a hole. And God gave me the knowledge to say that we're going to put it front and center, or front and to the right at least. And so when I look at the baptism, is a baptism isn't just about being baptized. It's about the experience of being baptized. Because, see, it's not just you that's laying the old man down. It is also your family that's watching you lay the old man down. The people that have followed you and been with you and walked with you and seen where you've been at and seen, seen where you, and, and, and see what you came from and where you're going to. It's those people that are surrounding you. Whenever Jesus was standing to get baptized in front of John, he, to John the Baptist, what did he say? He said, I want you to baptize me. And John the Baptist says, I am not worthy of bab- baptizing you. And Jesus sat there and told John and said that it's my honor to, for you to baptize me, to be a servant to, 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 that, you, that you're over top of me. It was an honor for that to happen. And there was an experience there that happened because what was the experience that happened at the time is that the heavens go, uh, came open and God said, this is my beloved son. It fell on top of him. I'm going to tell you right now that the baptism shouldn't be done back in a hole, but the baptism should be done out in front and center. Because it should be a life-changing event, not just, here's the thing, the baptism is a baptism for the person getting baptized. It's not just the person getting baptized, it's the family of the baptized. Because it's something that they've been praying for, or something they don't know anything about. It might be the thing that says, I want to be baptized as well. I want my old man to be put down and my new man to be brought up. I want that. I want this to change. And we don't want to hide it. We don't want to put it back in a hole. We don't want to sit there and say, it, it's just, it's, click it off the checklist. I got baptized. That's not baptism. Baptism is a change. It is something to be proud of and something, and something to, to, to embrace. And it's something for all the family to embrace and to have a celebration of it. So when we look at what the baptism is moving... In front and center, this is what the message is based around today. Front and center. Putting God front and center. Putting a change front and center in your life. Amen? See, I got y'all, didn't I? Nobody was even looking over. Jenna looked over. She's like, where is he at? (laughs) 
and you don't have to watch Pastor George walk all around the back and try to figure everything out. So, all righty. What do you think of the chair setup again? Back, okay. Jenna, Jenna liked her own little four seats. But see, what I enjoy is, I look at this family right here, second row from the back, Burton's back here. I look at the family, right? Like, the family actually fits, right? They, they're, not, they're not all here, but they, they normally take up three or four rows over here with the, when it, with the other seating. So it, it actually, it's, it's a blessing to me. It's not to room to spread out, it's, it's room for more. Amen? So the, God gave me what, the, what our purpose and our mindset is. And I talked about the, the, the stage. I talked about what we did, the, the mindset and the purpose of the stage. I, have, I had a dream before we built it that I was, in the dream was standing from this perspective here. And the dream was, it, it literally, it, like, it, was, it was like lights are shining and there's a person standing here worshiping. And that was my, that was my dream, my vision of it, and it's like exactly, I, I stood here one day, I think, I think Taylor was, was worshiping one day, and I came up around here during worship to grab something or whatever, and I saw Taylor sitting up here worshiping, and how the lights had hit, and I sat there, and I was like, that, that, that was my, that was my vision, my dream, that was the, the, that, that it's starting something more, because the whole idea and the purpose of the stage was, and this is, we let COVID move us onto a different rail, right? The purpose of the stage was, was to start to develop things, to have, to have um, you know, plays, skits, dance team, uh, supposed to be the, to have bands come in, to, to ignite the youth, to have bands come in, that we, that we come in and we worship, to have nights of worship to sit there and establish. An idea was not to be hindered by our setting, but rather be able to do anything that we wanted. And that was, the, that was a purpose of it. But it's the experience that matters once you build it. You know, um, Jenna hates the, which I'm going to say she hates the movie, the Field of Dreams. You know, build it, build it and they will come, right? It's kind of the same thing. It's like build it so you can do. Don't be short-sighted in what we're doing. Don't sit there and say, well, this is all we need for right now. Okay, we're not practicing for a church of 100 people. We're practicing for a church of thousands. Because per church of thousands means that people's lives are being what? Changed. So when a church says that they're okay being a small church, that I'm not okay being a small church. We're not a small church. But I'm not, I'm not okay being a small, be, uh, saying a church is small. Because when it comes down to it, it's the point of being a Christian is to establish followers in Christ. And if we are not establishing followers in Christ and our church isn't getting bigger, then what's that mean? We're not doing our job. That's the problem. It's, a, it, it's, it's like for me, do, okay, I like my Sundays. Would I be happy to have a second service on a Sunday? Yeah. Not for me personally, not for like what I want to do, right? Not to go home and lay, lay around or not get up or get up later and all be a bit more prepared. But you know what? I'll take a second, third, fourth, fifth service. I'll do whatever it takes because that means that li more lives, this is a, not saying lives haven't been changed at Cornerstone. I'm saying more lives are being changed. And my perspective has to be that where I'm at right now is great and it's wonderful and it's good, but God has so much more. And this is with our, with, with our lives in general, is that our lives have so much more than what we can imagine. There's a story in, I believe it is Matthew 16, and Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's telling the disciples that he's going to have to suffer that he's going to have to die, that he's going to have to go, go in, he's going to have to be criticized by, by, by the priest, he's going to have to go in and, 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 and have this dealt with over his life, that he, to, to become, to, to die and to raise for a purpose and a reason. 
And it says that Peter pulled him to the side, and Peter, and Peter told him, said, rebuked him, said, you, this, isn't, you're, you're, this isn't right. You shouldn't be doing this. This isn't what should happen. I can imagine him being like, Jesus, why would you bow down to them? You know, I've talked to, talked to all this before, sitting and talking how, how the disciples are almost like fanboys. They couldn't see that he was, he could possibly go down that road. That he was this great guy. This, that, I mean, look what he's doing. How in the world can somebody actually do something to him? And he's sitting there telling Jesus, this, this, there's another way, Jesus. This is what I can, there's another way. We can get around this. We, we can make a plan, we can do this, we can do this. And it says that Jesus turned at Peter and he, he said, get behind me, Satan. Was, was Peter Satan? But was Peter doing Satan's work? Because of Peter's undoubt. Is that the right word? Of his unbelief. He was doing the work of Satan because he didn't believe. Because Jesus said it, and he couldn't imagine his, uh, he couldn't imagine his life without Jesus. Couldn't imagine that this guy could sit there and give, oh man, that's, that's there's no way. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Not Peter. <laughs> Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. It's saying, get over what you think is the right way that things are supposed to be, and join what God is saying is supposed to happen. How many of us in our lives have we taken, we've had something that we've hindered God, something in our lives, because it just isn't what I want, or what I understand, or what I believe. God's saying, I need to do this. I need to go here. I need to talk to them. I need to, I need to deal with this. I need to have this in my life. And I just think, I just don't need that right now. I don't want that right now. I've told you all before with me, is I've made excuses, constantly made excuses about why I couldn't get into the ministry. And why I, could, why, why, why I didn't want to be in the ministry. And they were just what? Excuses. And there was no buildup that came out of it. It's a, there's an investment as a Christian. As you invest a little and it starts to build. And it builds in a point that you're not even have to work with it. That's what the investment is. Is that I'm putting the faith, putting the investment, putting the time. And then it, it's not that I have to sit. You know what? If you plant a seed and you put it in the ground and you wash the seed, is it going to grow faster with you watching it? Do you have to tend to the seed all the time? No. You know, I have to water it once a day or whatever it takes. I got to make sure all the weeds stay around it, and that's good. And then the seed is going to grow. Do you have faith when you put the seed in the ground that the seed is going to grow? Because you've seen it grow time and time and time again. So we put that faith into that seed, and we see it grow, and we see it happen. But I don't have to hold on to it all the time. I'm planting a seed. There's seeds in our life that we have to plant to say, I'm giving it to God 100%. Everything that I have, I'm doing what God's telling me to do. I'm not going to sit there and be like Peter and sit there and, and, and try to criticize what God's trying to say to do in my life. I'm going to plant a seed and let it build. I'm going to let it grow and I'm going to have faith in it. Peter, no, think about that with Jesus. He was saying to Jesus, You're not, you shouldn't do this. Instead of him sitting there saying, what can I do to help? How refreshing is it whenever you have somebody that when you're sitting there saying you need to do something and they can look at you and they go, what do you need? Even if you don't want the help, even if you don't take the help, but it's the, hey, I'm here for you. What do you need? It makes, it's like, it's like wow, that's great. Because a lot of people, they do what? Oh, I don't want to be involved in that. They'll, they'll stay away from it. When the person reaches out, there's, a, there's something that, there's a bond that starts to get built there. Peter, he goes, and what did he do? He started to deny Christ, right, on the night? Deny Christ three times. When he said there and deny Christ, Jesus said, said to him, said, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. Oh, no, Jesus, no, man. No, there's no way, because I've been with you the whole time. You've been living in my house. 
Ah, oh, there's no, no. What happens? Denied once, denied twice, denied third time. And I can imagine, that in my mind, it's the way it works. He's like, nah, man, I don't know him. Oh, man. Like, I imagine it's like right there, right on that, like, you know, like that movie build-up moment. Like, oh, I was so close. He didn't have faith, same guy. But he loved Jesus so much, and he let, he let the love of the man get ahead of the love of the ministry. Because when it comes down to it, it's, it, this, a, a man, like a, like a ministry will rise and will fall. But God will never fall. There's where, as a church, is to make sure that we are following the ministry, not man. Because when it comes down to it, you know, it we, we had the... Um, experience with with my my parents a couple weeks ago and it's, you know and it's like okay we need to change some things in the church and make sure that stuff is taken care of that we're kind of in gray areas because they've been running church stuff for 40 years and it's kind of been like ah, it's all right it's fine but it's not fine because you know what happens man falls and when man god never will Man does. So we have to make sure we are in, have stuff in checks and balances in order to make sure that when man does fall. Now, I'm using that as an example because preachers, teachers, prophets, they fall every day. Man makes mistakes. And normally what's going to happen is, is when a man falls, when a woman falls, you know what happens? is they become so discouraged on themselves that they can't see themselves being back in the ministry again because they made a mistake. So they're not believing the juice that they're teaching. Jesus forgives. That's a, pre- that's, a, that's a preacher, pastor. That's somebody that's supposed to be living that in their life. Now, I, I'm saying this because if a preacher, pastor can fall, and we say, well, they're, they're, they're a pastor. What is it for people that aren't pastors? Men, women, fall. (laughs) You have the faith that you don't fall. You you, you keep your eyes on it. But what I'm saying is, is that we have to make sure that we are living for the ministry, not living for the man. So here's where the disappointment can't happen with ministry. If you're living for the ministry, then you can't be disappointed in the ministry. You can be disappointed in what the man is doing, but not the ministry. I know that seems small, but it's not small. Because when I look at it, I, I, if I'm following somebody, I know that they're not going to be perfect and they're going to mess up. Because gosh, I, I know I mess up. I know I make wrong decisions. And I sure wouldn't want somebody judging me on being perfection when I know that I'm not perfect. So, man, what's our our observation? What is it that we're putting front and center in our life? Is it man, a a man, or God? Should be God, right? Our outlook has to be God's outlook. There's there's a, um, in Genesis 28, it's, uh, this is about the Jacob's dream. And my thing with Jacob was that he went and he laid his head down. And said he put a, put a stone on his head, and he laid there. And when he laid underneath of it, or on top of it, he fell asleep. And God sent this dream about a uh, ladder going to heaven and angels coming up and down. And basically the gist of the dream was God was saying, I'm giving you the land that you're sleeping on right now. And whenever Jacob woke up the next morning, he woke up and he, he said, it, it's, it, I think it's on here. Yeah, awesome, <laughs> which obviously that's probably not a, a Jewish word, but how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is, get the, this is the gate of heaven. His head was laying on a general piece of dirt, and he said, how awesome is this? this is the house of God? Where is the house of God? Wherever we are. 
Buildings go up, buildings go down. God never does. But what happened here with, with Jacob was is that he had, he, I, I believe that there was a realization that came to him because we, this is where our tithing comes from. That he's so blessed, God sat there and told him, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get this land. This is where your generation, this is where all the promises are going to come for. This is what you're going to have. It's the land that they went back to and they took over. It was the land that they still rest on today. God promised it to him. And, and you know what Jacob could have been like? <laughs> okay, all right. Sure. This, is the, this isn't my land. This is, I forget whose land it was at the time. This is their land. Instead, Jacob did what? He claimed it. He claimed that promise. He claimed the fruitfulness. He claimed it and said, how great of this. And then, not only did he claim it, but he said, I'm going to give God 10% of what I have to sit there and to honor you for what you're going to give me. Not what I have, but what you're going to give me. He claimed it. He took it. He had a heart for it. When we talk about, about offering, we talk about it being a heart thing. Just with Jacob was 100% heart. It wasn't that God said, it, it, did God ever say, you need to give 10% if you want this? See, that's a wrong tithing principle, right? right? I'm going to tithe so I get more. No. no God's going to bless us overflowing and abundantly so much that we can't handle it. But guess what? It's only going to be if we're doing it here, not if we're doing it here. Jacob had to, he, he, it was all 100% heart, is that he, but he had to accept the fact that God was going to bless him in that time. He took and put God front and center with everything that he had. He put there and said, God, I'm giving this out, I'm giving all to you. Everything. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to, I, I'm, I'm going to rejoice in you. I'm going to, I'm going to give up my finances to you. I'm, I'm going to make sure that you know that you are number one in my life. And that's what Jacob did. He put it front and center. And as time goes on, we know that Jacob took. What did I say? He was. Uh, uh, yeah. The, oh, oh. I didn't know where I was at. Fred saw me this morning. He said, I was, I was working on it, and he said, I was procrastinating. I said, that's what I do. It's that God, I, my, my messages don't finalize. As much as I try, let me, let me tell you, as much as I try, my messages do not finalize until 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning before service. It is so annoying. It's not because I want it. I'd rather have it down and move on. It's so annoying. But I open up the laptop or open up the, the tablet or whatever, and I'll look at it, and I'll say, and it, it does, I don't, it, I ask God to take that burden away from me, but I think it just keeps me off kilter just enough to make sure that I start speaking instead of concentrating what I have written. Because it's supposed to be about God, not about me. Not about my words and how, how I can take and write things, but instead it's about how God is going to speak through the things. Isaac asked me this morning, he says, you got it? I said, I got it for now. Pastor George looks at my notes and he sits there and he goes, he says, oh, so I have three things written down. Let me tell you, it's, it, when I'm, I'm talk, I wasn't going to talk about this, but it's, it's the same thing. It's being God-centered with it. And when I was younger and I was a pastor, start, started teaching, I used to try to put a lot of mat into things. When I say put a lot of mat into it, it means that I put a lot of what my knowledge was, and I filled it up, and then I felt like I needed to, I felt like I needed to go through it. When I, when I used to lead worship in the beginning, I used to, if I put down five songs, I thought I needed to do five songs, even though the fourth song was never supposed to happen, or the third song. That as I go through, I was like, well, I put it in there, I need to do it. I was putting what my mind was saying I need to do instead of what God was telling me to do. So I wasn't putting God front and center of my life. I was putting me. 
And then I wondered when things didn't go right and they failed. I wonder when I'd go home, when I'd kick myself over the message and be like, oh, that just didn't go as good today as I thought, but as, I, as I thought. Because it's not my message, it's God's message. And God, for me, God, it's, it's a continual work. Just what, if, I had that, my, if I had my father's knowledge, and I know I'm younger, and I know I have a long time to build it, but if I had my father's knowledge, there'll be a day I walk up here and I won't have notes. Because it's pulling it out to no longer, and it's just, God put this on my heart and be able to grab, grab, grab. And I've got a lot of that. But I'm saying there's so much more. Grab, pull it, grab, grab, grab. Just overload you with it until God says to stop. God, front and center, what are we doing? What experiences are we going to have? Don't rock the baptism. That's what it goes back to. I apologize to the people that got baptized in the hole. Because they didn't have the experience that they should have had. Because it wasn't just them, it was their family, their friends the church, the community. That's a lot of work to put that thing over there. I'm not even done with it yet. But there's a lot of work to put it over there. And I'm looking forward. We have a baptism. We have, I, I don't know. I know we at least have two to be baptized in it. And I'm looking forward to the first person that gets baptized in it. And this is where it comes down to me. A couple years ago, I talked about with baptism about how, you know, we can get saved over and over and over and over, right? You know you can get baptized again? Mike, did you get baptized again? Did you get baptized because of a message that uh, God gave me to speak? No. You made a decision. You get baptized again. It was important to Mike because of all the stuff that Mike had gone through in his life. The basically is like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm tired of this old stuff that I've been part of and I'm ready to put it behind me. Making something new. Saying, you know what? I'm done with this on myself. I'm ready to put God front and center in my life. And I'm going to baptize this with, with my family, with my friends, to make a significant choice here to say, from this day forward, from this day forward, I'm going to be a different man, different And I'm going to let everybody know. Because the old man has just been buried, and the new man has been brought to life. You want to know where revival comes from? It's from following God, plain and simple. Not from music, not from a word being shared, not from the gathering of people, but from the following, from God being put front and center in our lives. I don't care. You can come up and still play any music that you want and speak any word you want. If the presence of God is flowing through the place, it's not going to matter what is being said because the impact that's going to be there is because God's in, in that place and we're giving God the place that he's supposed to have. It's because of us being like Jacob, we're claiming what is coming, not sitting there saying, I'm questioning what is there. What is coming in my life? What am I claiming in my life? What is the thing I'm putting forth to say, this is mine? If God's given us dreams, visions of what we are, what we're supposed to be, then start to claim it and work towards it and, say, and start giving towards what that vision is. Your time that you have. If God says that you're supposed to be doing something, then start giving the time to it and start claiming it. When Jacob took and he gave, he gave of his finances, to he claimed, God, you're such a great God. You're an awesome God. You're awesome. Can we go back to that scripture? I want you to read the first line of it, though, what it says. First line, it says, and he was afraid, and he said, 
Have you ever been afraid because things are so good? You've ever been afraid of that? Man, I just don't want things to end. I'm afraid what's going to happen. He was afraid. And then he says, this is an awesome place. There's greatness on people's lives, and I believe it's on every Christian's life. I used to, used to feel that I had a greatness, or I still feel I have a greatness on my life. And my greatness that it comes down to is that I'm going to function in 100% in what God wants me to do. In the lives that are changed, that my, my greatest gift that I can give is for me to get out of the way and become the vessel that God can use me. Baptism is the same thing as when we talk about the... the uh, um, about the the thing that holds the wine. What's it called? Well, the wine skin. Yeah, the wine skin. The, the the importance of the that was a hard one, wasn't it? Yes, thank you. I I will take. Would you would you want to spit it out, George? I'll take that. It's fine. The the thing about baptism is about becoming new. You can't go and have this great inspiration that happened in your life and then go, but I'm going to stay the same way. Because just like the wineskin is, is when you put the new wine in the old wineskin, it can't survive. It has to be a new wineskin. Whenever you have revelation that happens in your life, you've got to become new wineskin to be able to hold it. And when a new revelation comes again, you become new wineskin. You can't stay the same as what you were, because if you stay the same, then you will burst at the seams, and you can't contain it. It's important for us to make that change. Just like Mike, I remember that because I was talking about it. I got, I got baptized when I was seven. Seven. Saved when I was five, baptized seven. You think I'm the same person today as I was whenever I was seven? Did I make mistakes between the here and there? I've been saved so many times. I've asked for, for forgiveness so many times. And becoming new, new, new. I'm getting baptized again. Maybe I'll be the first one. I'm looking for revival. That means God is in this place. Because revival means that people's lives are being changed. And I love seeing people's lives being changed. I like seeing lives change just like I like. I, I, I love seeing something built and something grow and something change and something be go from, from something ugly to something pretty. I love taking a piece of wood and turning it into something that's something more than just a piece of wood. Making a creation out of it. And my love with the, with the body of Christ is not any different than that. It's something that somebody thought was just a total piece of junk. And God says, oh yeah, watch this. And that's going to come with us putting God where? Not off to the right. right? Front and center. I'm telling you right now, if I, if I could have done it again, redesigned the stage, which I'm not going to do, but if I could have done it again, that's with it sitting right here, I would have cut the concrete, dropped the thing in, gave a thing to walk behind it, the stage flip over, and we would have just flipped it up and had baptism whenever... The, we were talking about doing a temporary baptism. You know why we didn't do a temporary baptism? It would have been a lot easier. Probably cheaper. You know why I didn't do a temporary baptism? Chris, why didn't I do a temporary baptism? So what? So much work. For who? The person that has to do it. And because I don't want it to be a burden to have for somebody to get something going. Because you know what my expectation is? Chris? I want to see people getting baptized so much, saved, baptized with the Holy Spirit so much that that baptism is flowing all the time. 
And I don't want it to be that if it was a temporary baptism, that means we have to come in, set it up, drain it out, do all the other stuff, check it, check the heat. We already did that. Uh, my mom posted something, uh, somebody this, this week in a horse trough. I did, I did the horse trough thing. I was, I was one of them that took, went out, filled it up, put the heat things in when we actually finally got the heat things, put them in, made sure it was all going, did all that, had to drain it out after we got done. I was one of them that was doing it. I understand but I want to see an explosion in the church in this area to the point that the baptism is never stopping running. That people are looking to have the old man put down, the new man brought up. They were they, they, they looking to put God so front and center in their life that they said, I can't live this way anymore. I want to be baptized so that way I can become the new man. And he has to go in and turn it on, fill it up, turn on the heater. People walk in, get baptized, and I don't put a burden on him. A man to do it because I don't want anything to hinder where God's wanting to take us oh, we don't want to get it out because it's such a pain in the butt no it's not took care of it not in a hole front and center people's lives change people's life renew revival's coming I love being on the ground floor of it because I get to watch people's lives changed, made anew. You want to talk? You want to really talk about a revival? I can look around here and I can. I've been here. I've been in this church for forty-three years, and I can look at it and I've seen people come to church, leave church, people pass away out of the church, and I can look around. And I could, I, it, it's, revival is that whenever, I mean, obviously I don't remember when I was 43, when I was, was born, but it's not the same people. There, there is spots of revival that happen constantly. But I want to see an overflow of revival. So much so that you can't contain it all. I want it to be sloppy. I want it to be that, that, that the Spirit of God that we we are functioning, that we are overflowing with the Spirit of God that's, that, that's, that's continually pushing out and people can't do anything but to be affected. That they walk in the door, I had, had visions and dreams as younger, that the person would walk in and they'd, be, they'd have an affirmity and they walk in and as soon as they walk in, that I'd see the, I'd be, I'd be teaching, this is before I was pastor, I was standing and I was looking, young, young. person walks in and would see the affirmity on somebody. And I'd see the affirmity on the person come off of them when they walk in the door. And if they want to try to come in, then at that point, then it's, we're praying for you and we're knocking that off of you so you can experience the fullness of Jesus Christ on your life instead of being held down by the things that the world tells you you have to hold and have to keep on you that Jesus says that today that you don't have to be held by those things. And you can function in the fullness and the glory of 100% Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. If God created this earth, if God sat there and gave us this place, then God can take stuff away. God can give us. God has promised us. You have promises on your life that God has given you. That's it's time for those things to be fulfilled. And the revival is of the people. Of God being center. God being in place. We all want it. It starts with this. God, front and center. Amen? God, pray over top of these saints this morning, right now in the name of Jesus, we glorify you, we praise you, we give you the honor that you have. God, just like Jacob this morning, we're, we're, we're taken and we're awakened up from our dream and sitting there saying, God, you are an awesome God and I am ready for the next thing to happen. God, I'm ready to invest into you. God, I'm ready to, to, put, to put stuff in my life into you. God, right now in the name of Jesus, I proclaim over top of us that we realize those dreams and we take and we rise up this morning, that we rise up this morning and we sit there and say, today is the day that my life has changed forever that the lord has made this day for me to sit there to honor you to, to be able to take and be able to make the way where i didn't think that there was a way because god i know that you are the shepherd that was leading me through this time that is giving me the path give me this place in jesus name we proclaim that amen
I'm going to encourage you what the baptism is. It's not just a one-time thing. If you want to be baptized again, if you're like me, I remember my, I remember my seven-year-old baptism. Because my fifth, fifth, five-year-old baptism, they scared me to death because they kept dunking people underneath them. It's in the power and the fullness of the Holy Ghost. I'm like, I was at Dwayne Dunnigan's house. I was like, mm-mm. I got, I got saved. I got saved like, I don't know, three weeks earlier. And we're, sitting, we're, we're doing that. I was like five years old. I was like, mm, no. Nope. The experience of my baptism was... <laughs> It's emotional, just stupid. <laughs> stupid getting old. Dumb. I used to never cry. I cry about everything. Toy Story 3 came out. Me and Jenna was at the theater. <laughs> you know, with every other parent. And, uh, even the guys that, that said they never cry, they're over there just like, oh, that's crying, you're crying. But my experience was is that whenever I was, I was seven, and I looked at my dad and I said, I said, do I have to get baptized like around other people in a pool or whatever? And he says, no, Matt, it doesn't matter. I was like, okay. He says, I said, can I get baptized now? Yep. So I went got the little round pool, you know, this deep, filled the pool up with water, and I got baptized. Did it mean something? Well, duh, obviously stupid but the thing is is if it meant something to me when I was seven how much more can it mean now so I'm going to encourage you I'd love to have a big baptism service to wear that thing out and not just us but all those we, we have a church that's wanting to come in and use it because they don't have a baptistry. How big of a blessing is it that we're able to let some other church use our baptistry? Because what are we in the business of? In the business of saving souls. Life's changing. Revival in this house. Amen? Well, thanks for listening. Sorry for the crying. And uh, I look forward to next week.